Welcome to another program in our series, Free Thinking Forum. It's my ple I'm Bill Weir, uh, uh, the host and producer, and it's my pleasure today to have with me Susan Gaynan. Thank you. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Uh, please describe yourself as an artist. I, uh, I am a, 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 an abstract artist. I am a whimsical wildlife documentarian, and that covers, a, that? Lot of, covers a lot of territory. Um, I s work out of a, a living room studio, which is on an interesting path and flyway for whimsical creatures. They come to my <laughs> studio, they sit for portraits, and they eat my snacks. But they also tell <laughs> stories, and that allows me to write books about them and also to keep painting them. But the, s the abstract work and the creature work comes together often because um, I can incorporate the, the um, designs, the abstract designs, into the creature's bodies. Now, I saw some of your paintings at First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. And with creatures on one side and the, at more abstract paintings on the other, they do come together. They do indeed. They do indeed. And sometimes um, the creature comes first and sometimes the abstract painting comes first. Um, for example, one of the creatures that was at, at, at FUS was uh, Mr. Klimt Bird, and in his body was um, a, a, a design called Conversations Connections. And I had worked out Conversations Connections from sitting on a very long conference call, series of conference calls, and we were not successful in achieving the goal of the many conference calls, but I got a great doodle out of it. Oh, and good. so that's how the Conversation Connection series began. But that's how Mr. Klimtberg got his body. Mm -hmm. Now, why do you make art? Is there fundamental um, motivation? I have always had to do something with my hands. I've always, I was always making messes. Um, my first art memory is that I was a passionate finger painter. Mm -hmm. So passionate that my mother finally put a stop to it because I wanted to paint, finger paint all day, every day, and everywhere. Um, <laughs> so out came crayons and we moved forward from there. But I've always had to do something with my hands. I couldn't just watch TV. I had to be doing something. Well, it seems that you love bright colors. I do. I and do. tiny designs. I do indeed. And part of the, part of the love of tiny designs comes from discovering the magic of detail when I was in either the fifth or sixth grade. Um, I was a bratty child and was sent to the back of the room because I was being disruptive and I couldn't see the blackboard. So I, the note went home, get this girl glasses. And so my parents took me to the eye doctor and I got, you know, I got an eye exam, I got a, um, a diagnosis, and in between diagnosis and delivery, my Girl Scout or Brownie troop went to Rock Creek Park in, in Washington, D.C. for a bird watching trip. And oh, I think I've heard you call that your art magic moment. It was an art magic moment because uh, there I was in Rock Creek Park surrounded by my friends and all kinds of stuff. And my friend, I did not have the word delusional in my vocabulary. But these people were saying, there's a red bird and there's a blue bird. Where? And I did not know what they were talking about. And I did not know how to say you're delusional or crazy. I was just <laughs> grumpy. And 40 years later, when I started to tell this story, one of my friends who was on that trip emailed me and said, I remember that you were terrible that day. <laughs> but two days later, on the following Tuesday, I got my glasses and I could see every leaf on every tree and every blade of grass. And I have celebrated that every day since. Wow. Uh, yes, <laughs> well, was first pair of glasses. First pair of glasses, it was magic. And it, it delivered uh, far more art to you. You could see the bluebirds and the redbirds. And, and everything, <coughs> and, and tiny details, too. Um, and, and, and I was always interested in making art. I mean, you ask, you know, why do I make art? I, have to, I always had to do something. And sometimes it was with crayons and such. But my mother gave me a spool for spool knitting. I don't know if you've ever seen that spool knitting. You have a spool and you crochet around the oh, yes. little breads. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, my mother gave me a, her spool and, uh, and started me on a project that I carried around for 28 years. 
um, finally made the rug and that was that. But uh, I, was all, I always had something to do. Mm -hmm. now, but you, I, I sense from what we've talked about, you, you want to spread whimsy. I do. I do, I do, I do. I have always, as I've been an artist and as I've been generally a person, I, I always see, I always try to find the good in people. I always try to find the humor in the situation. I know, and it's one of my many failings, that sometimes I am disruptive in meetings because I want to make a joke. I want to lighten up the, <laughs> I want to lighten up the proceedings. But as an artist, my prime directive is to spread whimsy. And if you notice, and we'll talk about this later, when you look at my work, there is no angst on the canvas. Um, when I'm making abstract paintings, they are, they're all about connections and how, showing how people can work and things can work. But everything works better because of the things that surround it. And that's, you know, it's spreading joy, spreading whimsy, and, uh, you know, and, and they're also, and then the stories that these creatures come and tell me, I think I was telling you that. They come to my studio, sit for portraits and tell their stories, these creatures, and they tell crazy whimsical stories. Can I tell you about Robert the Tap Dancing Rooster? Well, only if we get number... He's number six. Six. Okay. Number six. Robert the Tap Dancing Rooster was the first of the creatures who came to my studio um, and actually talked to me. Um, he came to my studio. He had been booted out of the hen house, and this is why. Why? He had learned to tap dance, and he became obsessed with tap dancing. And he tapped until 2 o'clock in the morning, and he did not want to crow at dawn. And the hens, knowing that he didn't really have any other purpose, which I did not learn till much, much later, <laughs> um, booted him out of the hen house. So he came to me for career counseling, and I was a career advisor for many, many, many years, although I advised oh. lawyers, not roosters. But he came to me for career advice um, and for a portrait. I painted his portrait. Yeah. And now he's on his way to be the world's first tap dancing rooster on Broadway. Um, he knows, he knows, he knows that there is a part in um, the mu musical Annie for called Rooster Harrigan. Mm -hmm. He does not aspire to that. He knows that that would be taking away a part that's played by a human. But what he really wants to be is a rock cat. But he's <laughs> too short. He's too short. But Robert was one of the first creatures to talk to me. And so when I tell that story, well, I love telling Robert's story because it makes people smile, it makes people laugh. And then uh, not too long ago, a guy said to me, you know, my girlfriend wanted to be a rock cat too, but she was too tall. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, spreading- Oh, there he is. Yes, spreading whimsy. Um, that's part of what I do and part of what I love to do. So Robert the Tap Dancing Dancer Rooster. Is, is and what I learned when I, um, last year I wrote the book, The Backyard Roosters of St. Paul, and I had to, to do a little bit of rooster research because there is no animal husbandry in my family and I knew nothing about roosters. And that's when I found out that you do not need roosters for the production of eggs, for fertilized really? eggs, for fertilized eggs, yes, but not for the production of eggs, which explains now in retrospect why they were so, it, why it was so easy for the hens to boot him out of the hen house. They really didn't need him if he wasn't gonna crow at dawn. <laughs> well, yeah, now you had some experiences uh, in high school with art. I did, I did. Because I was in the music program, I played the flute and piccolo, I didn't get to take formal art classes. But when I was a senior in high school, I was on the yearbook staff. And the, and the art teacher was the advisor to the yearbook. So, and the deal was once you finished your section, you could do an art project or a series of art projects. And at that time, I had fallen in love with wire sculpture. And I made oh. these little wire sculptures and bigger wire, I made little mice and bigger mice. And, and there was this incredibly toxic product called sculpt metal, which I also was fascinated by. It was a liquid and dried like metal. And we can't, I mean, how many brain cells were lost in that product, we do not know. But anyway, so I go, I'm making bigger and bigger mice creatures. And finally I made this um, five foot tall, three legged creature, covered it with sculpt metal. I loved it. How big? Five feet tall. 
Oh my. Yeah, yeah, my, my size. And I covered it with sculpt metal and I loved it. And the teacher looked at me and said, you know, you have no artistic talent. <laughs> and I ignored her. Well, good. I ignored her and think in retrospect, in retrospect, in her defense, the woman had not a whimsical bone in her body. Yeah. But I also understood that it was important for me to hear somebody say, I don't like your work. <laughs> because you, not every, everybody is not going to like your work. And the sooner you figure that out and learn to cope with it, the better off you are. So I, in retrospect, many years later, I do thank her. Good. She gave you the assurance that you're not an artist. And so, heck with her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I, I want to get to the rest of the works of art. I mean. Okay, let's, we can start with number one. Okay, which what, is, you, what do you call that one? That one is one of the kaleidoscope paintings. Oh. And that's where I started as a watercolorist. I started taking water, I started doing watercolor in 2006. I got an email from Split Rock, which you may or may not recall was the Arts and Crafts Extension Service of the U. Yeah. And they had, they, they always had classes up north for a week. But University of Minnesota. Yeah, wasn't? but this these were split rock shorts. These were three days here in the Twin Cities. Oh. And that was fine with me. And I took a watercolor, three days of outdoor watercolor. It was watercolor for the terrified because no one in the class had ever picked up a watercolor brush. <laughs> I took it. I loved the class. The teacher, James Boyd Brent, was fabulous. Um, and I loved t taking class from him because he didn't, he encouraged and he never criticized. Uh, when I went home, I went to my comfort zone, which is tiny designs in tiny spaces. Ooh. And um, I are, also- are, are you talking about number? I'm talking about number one. Number that's one. where I okay. started, number one. Um, got, that's, that's where I started, tiny designs in tiny spaces. And then um, soon after I started doing this, a friend tapped me on the shoulder and he said, oh honey, I love your work, but I can't put a postcard behind my sofa. So I had to start making bigger paintings, which takes us to number two, which is a painting in the boxes and dots family for me. And it's made with watercolor. All of these paintings are watercolor. And I had a wonderful teacher. I still have a wonderful teacher and friend, Russ Dittmar, who never met a color he didn't want to enhance. And he taught me to, to think lots of pigment, not a lot of water. That's how you get bright colors with watercolor. Yeah. And those, that opened the that, door. That is the most colorful watercolor painting I've ever seen. Thank you, thank you very much. But that opened the door to the, a long series of paintings about connections and neighborhoods. Because, and, and my goal as a painter for a long time was to show good neighbors and good neighborhoods and how people and things can work together. And if you look at that painting, and all of the rest of my paintings, all of the tiny spaces and, and tiny, um, the tiny, the tiny images all look better because of the things that they're next to. Yeah. You know, they all look better. Number three is par, is, is chronologically around that time. Oh, and the Number three, lower, which is called yeah. Terrazzo. Um, I was at the time paying a lot of attention to home and garden and television and learned what Terrazzo was which is uh, it's when you put stuff into um, concrete or marble and mm -hmm. it makes these designs. But I love that. I love making tiny shapes and tiny designs and making bright colors. And those were painted with what I called painstaking exuberance, which is a painstaking, pain, painstaking exuberance. Okay, <laughs> all right, so here's, I start with a pencil drawing and then I outlined the pencil drawing with Davies Gray, which is a light colored watercolor. Then mm -hmm. I colored inside the lines, which I got to be really good at when I was a tiny child. Oh, yeah. And then painted the outline of each shape and then painted an outline for each painting. I love that. That's, and that's how I make, that is my comfort zone of making paintings, good. lots of my paintings. Okay, then we'll get to number four which is part, which well, is on that lower, lower there, yeah. which is part of a series called Conversations Connections. I was on a series of conference calls to try and get a friend into a different job. We were unsuccessful, but we were happy about who the governor picked. Um, but we were unsuccessful, 
But I ended up with a doodle that I ended up doing over and over and over again into lar larger and larger and larger pieces. And if you look closely, you can see that each piece is connected to every other piece. And when you are trying to get oh, wow. things done, you need to have good connections with one another. Oh, These connections need to work <clears throat> with one another. And when people work together, you don't all look alike. You're not always the same color. You're not always the same belief system. But if you have to get something done, you have to, you know, you have to connect. You I have like to that connect. story. Yes. About number four. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's go to number five. Um, about a year and a half ago, I made this, a series of paintings, started making a series of paintings of this design, which is called Friendship. Complicated, sometimes messy, beautiful if you're lucky. <laughs> and I think that that is a true statement of friendship. And because each of those rings and links is connected to one another and they, the over and unders or the over and unders work, that's the challenge of them. But they mean, it, it just is what friendship is about. Because you know, there are, you can, I suppose you can have friendships that are absolutely smooth sailing all the time. But I think real mm -hmm. friendships have, bu they're bumps in the road. Yeah. Because, you know, and not because you're bumping at your friend, but things are happening to you and so, you're having to be helpful and understanding and, and useful. I mean, that's what friendship is about. So those connecting paintings, and I have a lot, a lot, a lot of those paintings because I love making them. And number that's number five. Okay, and then number six is Robert. And next to, next to Robert oh, is yeah, a frog. frog. Next to Robert is a frog. And where do the frogs come from? Um, I also paint, this is moving back to serious whimsy territory. Um, I paint- that is, that is serious whimsy. Okay, I paint <laughs> the, um, the pandas and frogs that live in the hidden bamboo forest of St. Paul. Oh. And how did that happen to be? Um, in, 19, in 2014 early, I was recovering from rotator cuff surgery and I was heavily morphinated. But I looked at the um, cover of Smithsonian, had a, the new panda on it, and said to myself, I could paint pandas. And sure enough, two days later, two of the pandas from the Hidden Bamboo Forest came to my whimsical studio and said, we will sit for portraits and tell you our stories <laughs> if you promise not to tell where the Hidden Bamboo Forest is. And I said what a Minnesotan would say was, you betcha. <laughs> so I started painting pandas. I did not bring any pandas today, they're very shy. Um, but their frogs live with the pandas in the hidden bamboo forest. Mm. And I can tell you that they, um, the forest is on a thermal vent. That's why we have, um, they have bamboo all year round. Mm. They, have, they, have TV, they have electricity so they can thaw some of the bamboo when it gets really cold. And they also have um, wireless so they can watch cable. Their favorite cable channel is the HG, Home and Garden Television. Oh, yeah. um, but they also watch the Puppy Bowl and the Super Bowl. So anyway, that's one of the, the frogs. And they all have that body, but their insides are all different. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a frog. And then one more, one more painting, one more. number seven. I also paint um, the lost cave paintings of St. Paul. I imagine and excavate them from the comfort of my living room studio, which unlike real caves, is uh, climate controlled and free of rats and bats. Um, I started to do this a number of years ago because I saw an artist named Paul Becker demonstrate gesso on board. And I had oh, no that, idea. That's gesso. That's it? gesso. And I had no idea what gesso was because I was a watercolorist, pure <laughs> and pure. But gesso, as you may or may not know, um, gesso in the modern age is an acrylic medium as thick mm -hmm. as Greek yogurt and you buy it in a tub. In the olden days, or if you were classically trained, um, in order to create this effect, you had to boil rabbit skins. And I can tell you, no, rabbit skin, no rabbits died for my work. But <laughs> um, the principle of the Lost Cave paintings of St. Paul is that I was able to use tinted gesso to create cave wall and then put all kinds of creatures on it. And that happens to be Max the cat from the cave wall. Max, um, Max the cat, he is my model muse and snacks manager. 
And who's to say that there was not a cat looking like Max in the caves in St. Paul? We do have the, we do have caves. I'm afraid the audience is not seeing them well because of the it's covered. It with is a little it's covered with plastic, but you can go to my website or you can oh, give me oh, a buzz. Oh. See you over at the uh, art shop. You can see me at the art shop at Midtown Global Market, which um, is a wonderful place, by the way. The art shop at Midtown Global Market has um, four owners and 120 Minnesota artist consigners. 120? 120, yes. Wow. And so when you come to the Midtown Global Market, come for the food because you cannot have, there is no bad food at Midtown Global Market. Um, and enjoy and, that. and yeah. stop in for the art because... It's just we have lots and lots of wonderful art, I, I artists work there. I imagine coming there and spending eight hours looking at well, 120. Well, it's it's not a big space, so but you could you could you would, but you could and we'd love to have you. We would yeah. love to have you. Um, but we have wonderful artists there. We have the work of Tara Inman, who uh, is one of our owners. She documented her journey from sighted to blind in 188 paintings. She, she was sighted and became yes, blind. Yes, became blind. And she knew from, from girl early childhood that she would eventually be blind, but it didn't start till she was in her 40s, this mm -hmm. journey. But her work is there and it's, it's amazing. It's just, it's just, we have so much really fascinating work there. Uh, I wanna see that. You should come, you should absolutely come. Um, and I think you were telling me about Old watches? Oh yes, I Megan Funk. Yeah. Well, you go find Megan. Megan Funk um, inherited a couple of old watches from her grandpa and took them apart and started making jewelry out of them and never looked back. Uh, and her work is amazing. And each of her pieces, she makes jewelry, and each of her pieces is in the dictionary under the word unique um, because when, unique means There's one of no a kind, other piece one of a kind, and yeah. they're they are just amazing. Uh, another one of our artists is Raylene Ash, who mm -hmm. makes um, beautiful, beautiful paintings. Um, and she originally was painting on paper bags. She still does, that, and people collect those paintings on bags. But she was the engine that drove the train that started the art shop, because she had come to Minnesota and was for a time homeless. And she was found by a Minnesota Without Poverty and the Jewish Community Council and the Lutheran Church Mount Olivet around the corner from. Um, oh, I've been there. Yes, around the corner from Midtown Global Market. And they found her and they got her into art shows and they watched her engage with people. And she's the most incredible people person ever. Um, and they watched people engage with her art, which is nothing but love and hope and peace and family. And among those three organizations, they said, huh, there should be an art shop at Midtown Global Market, a place for people like Raylene to get a foot into commerce. And four years later, here we are, and Ray's one of our owners, and her work is fabulous, and you should come and see that. Hmm. It's amazing, truly, truly, truly amazing. Uh, you, you also mentioned the fabric designer? Oh yes, Pamela Curtin um, was, in a previous life a fabric designer, but now she takes images of cats and birds and specifically roosters and owls, she's beautiful owls, and she takes the, um, the images from, of fabric designs that are in her, um, in her computer and does digital pieced patchwork. So, uh, you know, mm. no pins, That's no pins, no sewing, yeah. but it's, it's amazing. And she hung her work on the wall and I looked at it for a week and I kept saying, is it pen and ink? Is it collage? What is this? And she came and did an artist talk, digital pieced patchwork. And for everybody who knows anything about working with Photoshop and getting images to work, when you look at her work and you understand what it is, your jaw will drop to the floor. As awkward as that may be for your dental work, your jaw will drop. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> well, I got to see that. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. Now, uh, you, you mentioned a Venn diagram. Oh, the Venn diagram, one of the works that I sent digitally. Oh, do we have those? I don't know. Well, that's all right. If, we don't if have we talk. see it appear, if we see it appear, we'll talk about it. But I can talk. I would love to talk a little bit more about the lost cave paintings of Saint Paul because um, I'm a member of WARM, which is Women's Art Resources of Minnesota, uh, yeah. 44-year-old 
Oh, five parrots. That, yeah. Those are five parrots. Those are part of the Lost Cave paintings of St. Paul. And when being a member of WARM, I was in the protege, mentor protege program, the last cycle. And I can tell you that being a protege was the best art experience of my life and one of the 10 best experiences of my life. Well, thank because you to Warm. Thank you to Warm and thank you to Lael McDill, who is a polymer clay artist of great oh, genius. I had her on this program. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yes, she is a polymer clay artist of great genius. And I was lucky enough for her that she was my mentor. And in Warm, when you're in this program, you, 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 you make a contract and you, um, oh, there's the toucan who is um, also part of the Lost Cave paintings of St. Paul. Come on, you don't find a toucan in a cave in St. Paul. I am the boss of my cave. That's the, the I had, <laughs> in, in, in life, I had two jobs where I had to tell the truth all the time. I was, uh, was and am still a lawyer, and I was a career advisor, and you always have to tell the truth. But when you're a whimsical wildlife documentarian, oh. you get to make it up. You get Good. to make it up. So yeah. anyway, in this mentor program, and you make a contract in the beginning, and you say, this is what I want to do, da 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 And I said in the beginning, I want to do a big painting. Now, mind you, I had come with this as big to start with. And in the final show, the mentor protege show, I did a cave painting installation that was five feet tall and 10 feet wide. Wow. Yes, and it had a toucan panel and an elephant panel and an owl panel and a parrot panel and a cat panel. And you didn't bring them today? I did not bring them today. Five feet tall and <laughs> 10 feet wide? <laughs> yes, I did not, I could have, I thought about it and said, nah, I don't wanna haul them. Yeah. But, um, oh. Where, where can uh, somebody see them? They have to come to the outside of my apartment building at the moment. Oh, the outside? The outside, it's in the hallway. What's that? That is, a part, is my, one of my newest ventures. That's a painting called Neighborhoods 2. And it is finished in watercolor, but that is the um, unpainted version that I've made into coloring book pages. Oh. And so, and so you can, and I'm going to push the button and, oh, and make this possible. Yeah. Uh, for, it's uh, it's similar to one of those paintings, similar to painting that's at FUS, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to push the button and post the blog post so that people can order a 22 by 33 inch coloring book page this big or some smaller ones. As people, my friends have been after me to make coloring book pages forever. Yeah. And so well, my sweetheart would like one too. Well, we'll, we'll make uh, that happen. Can I give it to her on Valentine's Day maybe? You so, didn't we have Valentine's Day already? Oh no, we're still in January. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but yes. Well, this this <laughs> This will be on the air long after that. Oh, well, so yes. The answer is always yes. Yes, yes, yes. So what, what, what is the most significant quote or thought or idea or instruction that set your watercolor work on this path? When Russ Dittmar said to me, lots of pigment, not a lot of water will make bright watercolors, that's, that, that it. was it. That was absolutely it. Wow. Absolutely. Susan, we have filled the half hour. I thank you. It was fun. Thank you for tuning in for this marvelous time with Susan Gaynon, uh, the chief whimsy officer uh, at, at the intersection of abstract connections and whimsical wildlife. That's me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>